Once upon a time, deep in the misty Argonne woods, there was a mighty cyclotron. In its day, it was the greatest cyclotron in all the land. At the word of the alchemists, it set loose its glittering beam on strange materials to create elements afresh. In the shadow of the mighty cyclotron sat its apprentice, a little magnet orchestrating the allotment of gleaming ions to the targets for many generations. The little magnet dreamed that one day it too would be a cyclotron. Eventually, the mighty cyclotron grew old and tired, and was surpassed in grandeur by younger machines. In the days before the memory of the mighty cyclotron was forgotten, a young physicist was on a quest to find the perfect magnet to fit his cyclotron chamber. Of the many magnets in the land, only the little magnet fit. He rescued the little magnet and carried it away to his laboratory. The little magnet was finally transformed into a cyclotron. Nobel Prize winning accelerator physicist Simon Vandermeer is quoted as saying, accelerator scientists publish in concrete and steel. So here's our 5,500 pounds of prose. The magnetic field that the ions utilize in the cyclotron uh, is generated by this iron magnetic circuit. The magnet circuit consists of two vertical yoke pieces, two horizontal yoke pieces, two cylindrical pole pieces to which we attach uh, two pole tips to. The pole tips are shaped to form the magnetic field that the ions actually experience. To generate that magnetic field, the iron is excited by two identical coils, the top coil and bottom coil. Uh, in a normal cyclotron, these coils would be wired in series to force a uniform field balance at the midplane. However, this being an educational and experimental cyclotron, we individually energize these coils to intentionally force a field imbalance. With that field imbalance, we can raise the ion midplane up or lower it and we'll see experiments with that. This magnet, when fully energized, uh, will get to about 1.2 Tesla. A proton circulating in a one Tesla field has a revolution frequency of 15.2 million revolutions per second, or 15.2 megahertz. Each of the coils are energized by DC power supplies located at the control rack. The power leads come from the diode diode box and connect the terminals on the back side of the cyclotron magnet. At full excitation, the coils require 40 amps. The impedance of each of the coils is 0.8 ohms. So at full excitation, both of the coils are dissipating over a kilowatt of power. That energy is taken out with a deionized water cooling system. And the event that the water cooling system fails, we have a backup by monitoring the coil pack temperature. The temperature is monitored by two thermocouples, one on the top coil, one on the bottom coil, and is actively being read out by the machine protection system, PLC. If the coil temperature exceeds a designated threshold, it will gently shut down the magnet power supplies and prevent the coils from being damaged. The DC power system for energizing one of the magnet's coils begins with a programmable constant current power supply that feeds what we call the diode diode box named for housing two protection diodes for each coil. It also houses a precision shunt for measuring the coil's current. The first diode is the series diode that passes current in the desired direction, but prevents a reverse current being delivered to the power supply. The second diode is a reverse bias diode to shunt back EMF current in the event of an abrupt shutdown. The box contains a four pole double throw knife switch to reverse the polarity of the magnet. There are two identical power supply systems, one for each of the coils. Both power supplies are controlled by the control box, which brings both of the coil power supplies up and down together and an adjustment for a differential between them. The diode diode box is located directly above the two magnet power supplies. Let's pull it out and look at the hardware. First, we have to remove it from the control rack to get inside.
this is what we call the diode diode box. It was a homemade box to uh, both protect the power supplies from the magnet and allow us to reverse the polarity of the magnetic field. The left side is the top coil, the right side is the bottom coil. These two leads come in from the power supply. The positive lead comes down, goes to this terminal of the knife switch. The other lead uh, goes through a shunt, so the shunt is at the low side. There is a series diode here, which is a reverse protection diode. And then there is a, a reverse bias diode, which is also another reverse protection diode. So if the power supply abruptly shuts off and the field collapses, the back EMF is shunted through this diode and is uh, held off by that diode. So the power doesn't go back into the power supply, but rather is shunted through the coil and it's dissipated in the coil and the diode and, and the lines. It's, the system is symmetric on both sides. This shunt is what's used to make the precision measurement of the magnet current. We don't rely on the reading on from the front panel of the power supply or even the programming voltage, but the two Agilent five-digit multimeters uh, give us a precision current. And that's what we use to monitor the magnetic field by the current. Now let's say we want to operate with a negative ion, such as H minus. We uh, need to either put the vacuum chamber in upside down, because there is a preferred rotation the way the phosphor screens and deflection channel is set up, or we need to flip the polarity of the magnet. But these are unipolar power supplies, and uh, it's not easy to change the polarity. However, with this setup, we can take the knife switch and flip it. You'll, you'll see that these leads invert the polarity of the magnet. So now the top pole, which is typically the north pole, becomes the south pole and vice versa. Doing this while the magnet was energized would be such a catastrophic <laughs> event that uh, we buried this knife switch inside this box. So it really meant you'd want to have to do it and not just accidentally throw the big switch. So therefore we shut everything down, de-energize everything, unbolt this box, untie up all the cables, slide the box out, remove the lid, and uh, then very intentionally flip the switch. So we'll go back to the polarity for protons and deuterons, keeping the top pole tip, the north pole, pole piece, and uh, there we go. To control the magnet, the operator interfaces with the control box that we see here, and we read the magnet coil currents from these precision meters. Because the shunts are 1 milliohm, a 1 millivolt reading on the meter corresponds to 1 ampere of current. There are 4 knobs on the control box. The upper left is a coarse adjustment of both coils simultaneously. The upper right is their fine adjustment. The bottom left knob adjusts only the bottom coil to introduce the current and hence field imbalance. The bottom right knob does nothing. Let's pull the chamber out and explore the field a little bit. This will help us visualize the field lines. The gap is nominally two inches. With these good weak focusing pole tips, the gap opens a slight amount with radius. Before we can energize the power supplies, we need to enable the PLC's magnet permission. We begin ramping up the current and hence the magnetic field. With just the modest field, we can visualize the fringing of the magnetic field with a 3D compass. The upper pole is the north pole and the lower pole is the south pole. Note that while the fringing is dramatic this far outside of the gap, that the field is still completely vertical in the midplane. Now, let's play a little. What's the point in having a big magnet if you can't have a little fun with it? Suspending an Allen key with one finger, balancing a paper clip on a fingertip, ugh, almost. Found it. Paper clips are the most fun. One of my favorite demonstrations is slowly inserting an aluminum plate into the field and fighting the eddy currents by trying to pull the plate out as fast as possible. Willow tries to insert a large bar of oxygen-free high-conductivity copper into the gap and she is met with quite some resistance. Another favorite is a demonstration Professor Ulrich Becker showed me at the old MIT cyclotron magnet. A cylinder of aluminum will freely slide left and right, back and forth, but if you go to turn it, you are met with an alarming resistance. All that Professor Becker would say was symmetry breaking. I would like you to try to figure out what is going on. The spinning copper ring is stabilized by the vertical field. To me, this is reminiscent of the time machine's talking rings. When knocked over, it will fall very slowly. This is in fact real time, not slowed down. 
And again, this is due to induced currents. Before powerful computational tools were available, the ancients of accelerative physics used a technique called a floating wire to verify beam orbits. An energized loop of wire immersed in a magnetic field will conform to the path of the equilibrium orbit of a charged particle. We are visualizing the ion beam's path for this particular orbit, hence its energy. The floating wire will demonstrate the shifting of the midplane with an intentional field imbalance. The wire demonstrates radial stability to a perturbation, indicating that there is a preferred center to the orbit. Next, the paperclip collection. They will try to align themselves with the external stray fields, but are balanced against their mass and are very sensitive to the magnet's field strength. The iron yoke confines the magnetic field and concentrates it at the gap. The iron is excited by two identical coil packs. Near the center of the magnet gap, the field strength B is mu naught I over G, where mu is the permeability, I is the ampere turns, and G is the height of the air gap. We can also write this as B equals mu naught little i n over G, where the coil is made up of n turns of current I in each turn. For a given number of ampere turns, the larger the gap, the lower the field. The cyclotron frequency is QB over 2 pi m, and we can calculate for protons to circulate around 15 million times a second. We need a magnetic field on the order of 1 tesla, or 10 kilogauss. Let's take a closer look at the effect of the pole tip shape. The field lines start at the north pole and terminate at the south pole. Even with the pole tips that are intentionally tapered, the field is completely vertical at the center. This is the point where the field will be the strongest. The vertical magnetic field will slowly decrease with increasing radius and when it nears the edge of the pole tip, the field will begin to plummet. Also note that the magnetic field is completely vertical in the midplane. However, as the field bulges or fringes out, the weaker the midplane's vertical field becomes. This is necessarily compensated by an increase in the radial magnetic field components. This can be described by the field index, denoted as n, and is the rate of change in the midplane's vertical magnetic field with radius, and normalized to the radius and instantaneous magnetic field. Convention adds a negative sign. We plot the field index as a function of radius and see that it starts at zero and climbs for a decreasing field. This type of field has important focusing properties that we will learn about in the Betatron motion episode. The B equals mu naught I over G relationship assumes the iron is completely linear. We will measure the field at the center of the gap as a function of current. For this measurement and the field mapping that we will do soon, a DSP-based Hall probe is used. When making the B versus I current plot, it is important to always ramp the current in one direction and not reverse mid-measurement because of the iron's hysteresis. In this B versus I measurement, we are taking the average of the top and bottom coil currents. And for this measurement, they are very close to each other, varying a few percent at most. For the most part, the response is linear, but around 1 tesla or 10 kilogauss, we see that the iron begins to saturate. Typically, we operate the cyclotron with beam around 1 tesla. Let's shut down the magnet and swap out the good weak focusing pole tips with another set. Even with the magnet de-energized, the residual magnetization makes it hard to pull off the pole tips. We have a total of five sets and material to make one more set. Each of the pole tip sets were machined from 1008 magnet iron, such as this billet. The first set are the good weak focusing pole tips designed by Carolyn Chun in 2001. The next set I designed to be a bad weak focusing field to intentionally drive a beam resonance. Claudia Rochot designed this weak focusing set to emulate a relativistic mass increase for 230 MeV protons. Bill Schneider made the radial sector pole tips for us to develop our field mapping skills, which we would need for Aaron, Kirsten, and George's azimuthally varying field spiral sector pole tips, which work superbly. I will bolt up the radial sector pole tips to map. Once they are on, I install the XY mapper in the whole probe housing.
With everything secure, we ramp up the field and begin the mapping. After completion of the scan, our MATLAB code plots a field contour map. A three-dimensional mesh view really drives the visualization of the central bump, the hills, and the valleys of the radial sector field. One of the post-processing analyses is to find the center of the radial sector AVF field. This is done by plotting the vertical field around an arbitrary circle as long as that circle encompasses the magnetic field center. The fourfold symmetry is clearly seen, and as the circle nears the center of the field, the plot becomes less distorted and more sinusoidal. Plotting the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th Fourier harmonics, we see that the center is located when the 4th harmonic is maximized and all the others are zeroed or minimized. This process is iteratively repeated in X and Y to hone in on the center. Similar analyses can be performed for both azimuthly symmetric and azimuthly varying field configurations. An interesting feature that we observed with our spiral sector pole tips are off-center stable orbits. Now, this is a bit beyond the scope of this episode, but it is too interesting not to mention. They were in fact first predicted by Aaron, Kirsten, and George's simulations of orbit stability. In addition to the expected central equilibrium orbit, seen as the central closed contour, four others appeared. After machining the pole tips, we were able to observe these off-center equilibrium orbits with the floating wire technique. The wire loop snaps to the nearest equilibrium orbit, like a Ouija board that actually works. The equilibrium orbit is defined by the path that encompasses the necessary magnetic flux to close the orbit loop. This does not necessarily have to be a circle. In the AVF fields, it becomes apparent that there can be other paths that enclose the same flux as the primary equilibrium orbit, but are just off-center. The magnet, while being the largest component of the cyclotron, is just the beginning of the many components necessary for the cyclotron to work. The next necessary condition that we will explore in the cyclotron is almost nothing, a very special type of almost nothing, the vacuum system.